the message we proclaim, it is the revelation of a mystery, a mystery not previously made known, but now entrusted to us. And the significance of this mystery can hardly be overstated. It is history changing, society reshaping, world transforming. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. Today we're going to begin a message entitled Proclaiming the Mystery of the Gospel. And Jonathan, for those who maybe have never heard the gospel referred to as a mystery, what do you mean by that? Well, in the world of the Bible, a mystery is something that God has not previously made known but which he has chosen to make known at a particular time and in a particular way. And when we're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're talking about a mystery which has been made known through Jesus and his apostles and written down in the Bible for us to discover. And it is a wonderful mystery to discover. You know, as we think about the gospel in terms of a mystery that can be discovered, there may be some who would say, well, then, if it is a mystery, how do we know that we're understanding it correctly? I mean, how do we, we know that we can actually solve this mystery? Well, and that's really what the gift of the Bible is all about. We understand that the Bible is given to us by God as a work of revelation through His Spirit. And as we come to the Bible, we are entering into spiritual mysteries that have been clearly set down for us in, in the Scriptures. And if you've had experience reading the scriptures or studying the Bible, you'll know that it is a it is a book that is understandable. As we come to it and give our attention to it, God enables us to understand these these mysteries. And and of course that's our that's our focus here on the program to open up the Word of God. So let's do just that. Let's open uh, the Bible together to the book of Ephesians. We are in chapter three. First 13 verses today as we begin a message entitled, Proclaiming the Mystery of the Gospel. Here is Jonathan. I wonder if you ever feel that the gospel sounds unimpressive, that its presentation is unremarkable, that its effects in your life or in the lives of those around you are rather undramatic. I wonder if you ever feel that the church of Jesus Christ, this church, the particular church that you've come from, the church as you know it and the church as you experience it, I wonder if you ever feel that the church itself is feeble and is flawed. I wonder if the struggles of the people of God, the limitations we all exhibit, the opposition we may face from time to time, I wonder if these things ever discourage you, ever get you down. The Apostle Paul was conscious that in his day, the people of God could easily become discouraged. He knows that the Ephesian Christians, as they hear of his struggles and they learn of his weaknesses, he knows that they might well feel discouraged about him. And so his purpose in these verses in Ephesians chapter 3 is to address those very feelings and to do so from the perspective of his own situation in history, his own ministry, his own story. It seems as though in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is gearing up to pray for the Ephesians. He'd, he'd been praying for them back in chapter 1, if you were there with us at that time. He, he seemed to step away from it in chapter 2, and now it seems that he is gearing up to pray once more. But he rather abruptly interrupts the prayer again at verse 2, and he doesn't actually proceed with it until verse 14. In any case, here in verse 1, he's gearing up to pray, and he says this, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, at that point he breaks off. He stops in his tracks. It occurs to him that at this point, his situation as the leader, the apostolic leader for these Ephesian Christians, his, his personal story could be a discouragement to these believers. He is their apostle, but he is, after all, the apostle in chains. Paul's own story is quite a story, actually. In proclaiming the gospel, he faced huge trials and very great opposition. The story of the book of Acts is, in many respects, the story of the trials and difficulties, the humiliations and the oppositions that Paul faced as he went out to make Jesus known. Paul tells of being flogged, of being beaten, of being stoned, of being starved, of being shipwrecked multiple times. 
and the list goes on. And now he writes in chains, imprisoned in Rome. I was thinking of Paul's shipwreck just the other day when I read news that an ancient Greek merchant vessel has been found at the bottom of the Black Sea. I don't know if you saw that headline in that story. I think it's the oldest shipwreck ever found to date, amazingly preserved in oxygen-starved waters way at the bottom of the Black Sea with its, its rudder and its rowing benches still in place. Quite remarkable. The ship predates Paul's time by quite a way, but the images brought to life something for me of the reality of what Paul lived through. You could just imagine Paul being transported on such a vessel, facing shipwreck as this vessel did. In any case, Paul is conscious that his experience and his story might make the Ephesian Christians feel discouraged, might make them think something less of the gospel, something less of the church. He almost apologetically speaks of himself in verse 8 as less than the least of God's people. And he finishes the passage, you'll notice, with a plea to them, verse 13. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Don't be discouraged, says Paul. Don't be discouraged if the packaging and the presentation of the gospel look weak, if the messenger is weak, if the opposition is strong. Now, that's an encouragement that the Ephesian Christians needed in their day, and it is an encouragement, I believe, that we need in our day as well. I had the pleasure of meeting some newcomers last Sunday, a couple visiting us from overseas. They said how they were enjoying their visit, and the lady commented to me that this church really looks like a finely tuned machine or something to that effect. And as she said that, I thought to myself, if you but knew. <laughs> if you but knew all the challenges all the ways that we fall short, all the things we get wrong, all our weaknesses, all our flaws. And I, I said to her, I'm so glad it looks that way. <laughs> That's wonderful. But you should see the realities. And if we know the work of the gospel, if we know the life of the church, the realities of church life, it's easy to see the cracks in the edifice. Of course it is. The weaknesses in the structure, the flaws in the works, the blemishes in the presentation. It's easy to look on these things and then become discouraged. I was hearing just the other day from a Christian brother serving in a very, very challenging part of the world. He, he shared with tears in his eyes how pastors are being persecuted and imprisoned in his country, how congregations are coming under immense pressure, how the proclamation of the gospel is being actively opposed. And it's easy to hear that heart-rending report and to feel very, very discouraged, to think that this whole gospel enterprise is weak and faltering. And so knowing how easily we might be discouraged, Paul sets out in these verses to show us that the gospel he proclaims is a very wonderful and very majestic thing, however weak and however messy things may appear at the present time. Don't be discouraged, says Paul, because through the gospel, we, the church of Jesus Christ, you and I, understand a profound mystery. Verse 2. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. This mystery, verse 5, was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. I don't know if you like mystery movies or if you like picking up the latest mystery TV series on Netflix or whatever. Our kids have just discovered the old board game Clue. Maybe you remember it. Who did the crime? Was it Miss Scarlet with the candlestick in the dining room or, or whatever it was? Now, that's the kind of thing we think about when we hear the word mystery. But when the Bible talks about mystery, it is not talking about intrigue or deception. It's talking about truths which cannot be known by human beings apart from the revealing work of the Spirit of God. Truths which perhaps were not previously made known to us, but which have now been revealed to us in and through the person of Jesus Christ. And Paul wants to remind us that he himself has been given a very special privilege by God. He was given insight to the mystery at the heart of the gospel. Before the coming of Christ and before the ministry of the apostle Paul, this great truth was to a very significant extent hidden. 
it wasn't made known to people of former generations. That's what Paul is saying. Well, here is the mystery which has been entrusted to Paul, the great mystery that really lies at the heart of his ministry as the apostles to the Gentiles, verse 6. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message called Proclaiming the Mystery of the Gospel. It's from a larger series, The Unsearchable Riches of Christ. And today we've been looking at Ephesians chapter 3, first 13 verses there, and looking at the mystery of salvation, how Jesus brings salvation to all who believe. We're going to get back to this message in just a moment, so I hope you will stay with us. If you want to find out more about Jonathan and about Encounter the Truth, I encourage you to come check out our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. While you're there, you can find out more about our weekly devotional. Check that out. Just click on the link that says Moment of Truth. And you can find out more about a gift that we'd love to send you. It's a book written by Colin Webster called Time Well Spent. It's about how we develop a daily devotional life. I think many of us, when it comes to a devotional life, we know it's important, but we may struggle to get started for all sorts of different reasons. Maybe you feel like you're so busy you can't just add another thing to your to-do list, or it feels like it's a strain on the brain more than fuel for your soul. Well, Colin Webster takes on these concerns in his book, Time Well Spent, and we'd love to send you a copy as you give a financial gift of any amount in support Encounter the Truth this month. Our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. Our toll-free number you can call is 1-833-998-7884. That's 1-833-99-TRUTH. Or again, the website is EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, let's get back to the message. Once again, here is Jonathan. If you were with us here last week, you'll remember that this was the particular focus, really, of the second half of chapter 2. The gospel, it breaks down barriers. It brings Jew and Gentile together. It makes us one in Christ. Now, it's interesting that Paul speaks of this as being a mystery. The the seeds of that promise are, of course, found in the Old Testament. We thought last week about God's great promise to Abram, whom he called Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham's family, they would receive blessing. They would become a great people. They would be given a land. And as they are blessed and protected by God, they will become a blessing to the world. Right there, right from the start, there is this promise and this expectation that the salvation blessings that God gives to Abram's family will spill over to the world. But the full reality of verse 6, what Paul is talking about here, that wasn't articulated. It wasn't expanded upon. It wasn't laid out in explicit detail. And for the Israelites of old, what Paul is saying here, it would have come as something of a shock. You see, the full implications of what Paul is saying here, they are immense and they are entirely profound. He drives home this idea of togetherness between Jew and Gentile, and he piles on the language and the imagery of togetherness actually in three layers here in verse 6, and perhaps you can see them as you look at the verse. The mystery revealed to Paul says that through the gospel, Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. Israel's heritage as a nation, as a people, was nothing less than the covenant promises of God, first given to Abraham. Over the years, this promise of being God's people and knowing God's blessing, it was supplemented and it was reinforced by wonderful promises of salvation, promises of the forgiveness of sins, of the gift of the Holy Spirit, of a new home in a new heavens and a new earth. The weight of this inheritance, the value of it, the splendor of it, well, here's what Paul is saying, the Gentiles who hope in Christ, they now share in it. The outsider, the foreigner, the former enemy suddenly treated as family. Added to that, the Gentiles are members together of one body. Again, this is a very stunning truth. It's a very big truth. In the society of Paul's day, if a young Israelite married a Gentile, the family would hold their funeral. Being joined together with a Gentile was the equivalent of death in a very real sense. But now, united in Christ, they are members together of one body. 
they're truly united. Barriers brought down. The two made one. Jew and Gentile, Paul says, finally, are sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. The word Christ, as you may know, means Messiah, the promised Savior King coming to Israel. The nation held great promises of the King who would come to bring them salvation and the fulfillment of the plans and the purposes of God articulated throughout the Old Testament. And the supreme hope of many Israelites in Jesus' day was that this Messiah who would come would defeat the pagan nations all around them and give Israel a stunning victory, a public victory. But Paul's message here, it almost sounds subversive. The promise of the Messiah is actually for Gentiles, for foreigners too, if they will also believe. Now, this is a mystery that's been revealed. It wasn't obvious to Israel of old. It wasn't exactly what they were expecting. They weren't expecting that the Lord's intention was to create a new humanity in Christ, a new people redeemed by His blood, filled with His Spirit, united together in Him. The reality of what was coming, the full extent of it, it was far greater and far more wonderful than they could have possibly anticipated or imagined. But now the Lord has made this mystery known in a special way to Paul, and he has been given this particular apostolic mandate to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. That's his job. God decided in his infinite wisdom that this history-transforming news, the revelation of this great mystery, it would come to the nations through the agency of a frequently shipwrecked, often maligned, widely mistreated, regularly imprisoned apostle by the name of Paul. It was through this seemingly weak and thoroughly surprising agency that the mystery hidden for ages and generations would come to the nations. And Paul says to the Ephesians, don't be discouraged by the packaging. Don't be put off by the messenger. The packaging and presentation of the gospel, the church and the people who serve within it, these things can look feeble and they can look unimpressive. As a body, as a community, we can look faltering and very flawed even to ourselves. And we know that the world will often look on us in scorn. But Paul wants us to see this morning that the message we proclaim, the biblical, the apostolic gospel that has been entrusted to us in the Word of God, it is the revelation of a mystery, a mystery not previously made known but now entrusted to us. And the significance of this mystery can hardly be overstated. It is history-changing, society-reshaping, world-transforming. It's the mystery that actually addresses the fundamental human need, that provides a solution to the human condition that no philosopher or politician or think tank or academic can ever provide. I think these are very fascinating days in which we live. The winds of change are very definitely blowing, and disruptive forces of philosophy and politics are reshaping our world in significant ways. It's a fascinating time, and I think that for the Christian, it is a very instructive time as well. It is instructive because it reminds us that human solutions to social problems are always limited and are always flawed. No system is perfect. No human philosophy is infallible. For many years, we've lived in an environment in the West where certain values were just taken as as absolutely true. They were a given. And they were presented as being the solutions to the world's problems. Globalism, free trade, social liberalism. These were widely accepted as the natural and the obvious solutions to the world's needs. Promote these things and you will have a just, peaceful, equitable, and prosperous society. That's what many of us grew up on. But now a whole new generation of politicians and leaders throughout the Western world have called that entire worldview into question. And the message is that these solutions were actually hindrances. The solution is the problem. Now, I don't mean to comment on the rightness or the wrongness of any of that. That's not my my interest here this morning. But I do want to observe this. What one generation takes as the obvious solution to the world's problems, another generation just as quickly discards. 
And as we look back through modern history, we've seen that pattern repeat itself again and again and again. It is a sobering observation. It's a humbling one. And it highlights our great limitations as human beings to understand, let alone solve, our own problems. And it reminds us that what we really need is a fundamental solution to the most deep-seated problems of the human heart and of our fallen world. Now, as believers in Jesus Christ, as the people of God, we know that the solution is not to be found in a new philosophy or a new approach to trade, a new defense strategy. That solution is not to be found in the great halls of global power or among the intellectual or the political elite. See, that solution is to be found in a mystery revealed in Jesus Christ, entrusted to the Apostle Paul. The solution to a fractured, a sinful, and a warring world is to be found in this great mystery of which the apostle speaks and which he proclaimed in all his weakness. That solution to the world's greatest needs is the mystery that through the gospel, the Gentiles, the nations of the world, the former outsiders to the promises of God, the Gentiles are heirs together of one body, sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. You see, the solution to the world's problems, it is the gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ which brings salvation blessings to all who believe. That gospel doesn't promise, of course, to solve all the world's problems this side of heaven, but it does deal with that fundamental issue of sin and of separation. And it does open the way for each of us to an eternal future where war and discord and suffering and poverty and disease and much else besides are all done away with and where they are no more. The gospel opens to each of us who believe a future where true peace, harmony, and justice are to be found. We have the mystery it's the message that we have been given and that we have been charged to proclaim. As the church of Jesus Christ, as individual servants of Jesus Christ, we may look weak and we may look messy. We may look very, very flawed as indeed we are. The world may look on us and think us foolish and very unsophisticated for our beliefs. But we do have the key to history, make no mistake. We do have within the Word of God the solution to the deepest needs of humanity. We have the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, do not be discouraged. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, a message called Proclaiming the Mystery of the Gospel. Again, we've been in Ephesians chapter 3 today, and we're going to continue this message next time, so I hope you make it a point to tune in. If you ever miss a broadcast, though, you can always come and listen online. Catch up when you visit our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, if you are a regular listener to this broadcast, you know that Encounter the Truth depends on your generosity to keep Jonathan's teaching on this station. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book called Time Well Spent. What is this book about, Jonathan? Well, it's about a simple theme, but a really important one if we want to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about developing a rhythm and a pattern of daily devotions. And that means really spending some time reading God's Word, the Bible, and responding to Him in prayer. It's, it's an important thing for anyone who would walk with Jesus to develop that pattern, but it's not always easy to get there, especially if you're starting out from scratch and you've, you've never really done that before, never really been encouraged in it. And, and we think this little book will be a real encouragement to you as you think through how to do that and why to do that, we think that if you can develop that discipline for yourself, you will find that you will grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and we just want to encourage you in that. Well, the book is called Time Well Spent, A Practical Guide to Developing Your Daily Devotions. Again, it's our thank you gift to you as you give a financial gift of any amount this month. Give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-998-7884. That might be easier to remember as 833-99-TRUTH. Or again, come to the website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.